I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, to Ezekiel chapter 36. And tonight I want to bring you a message entitled, A Heart Transplant. Ezekiel chapter 36, and there are four verses to which I want to draw our attention tonight. Ezekiel 38, excuse me, 36, beginning in verse 25, God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel speaks of, in the clearest description that we have anywhere in Scripture, what are those distinguishing marks of the new birth. I want to begin reading in verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will be my people and I will be your God. The greatest miracle that God ever performs is the miracle of the new birth. Greater than God creating a heart at birth is when he creates a new heart in the new birth. This is the miracle that God works every time someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. We must understand that regeneration or the new birth and conversion are the heads and tails of the same coin. Conversion is man's part. Believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, coming under conviction of sin, repenting of sin, surrendering one's life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is conversion which, by which we turn from sin and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe upon Him. But the other side of the coin is God's part. That is the new birth. That is regeneration. That is a work of God's saving grace that God alone can perform. And it is regeneration that causes conversion. It is the new birth that stands behind conversion. It all happens in a moment. It all happens at the same time. It's not a matter of chronology. It is a matter of cause and effect at that split second when someone calls upon the name of the Lord, it is God who is at work in that heart, God birthing them into his kingdom. And as they call upon the Lord, it is like a new, newly delivered baby that gasps for air as it comes out of its mother's womb. And, and that sinner calls upon Jesus Christ for salvation. But it is only because God has been previous it is only because God is already at work in a very powerful and effectual way in that person's heart. And so tonight, I want us to have the joy of looking at this passage of Scripture, and I want to bring to your attention several distinguishing features of the new birth. And as we do, I want you to consider your own testimony. I want you to consider your own conversion. And I want you to be reminded of what God did in your soul what God did in your inner spirit when you came through the narrow gate and when you believed in Jesus Christ. It was God who was there. And it was God who was inducing labor and bringing you forth into his kingdom. As we look at this passage tonight, it would be important for you to know, before I lay out these distinctives, that as, as God says this through the prophet Ezekiel, he's looking to a future time of Israel's conversion, a time when they will be brought back into their land, a time at the end of the age when all Israel will be saved, according to Romans 11. And as God looks to that time when Israel will be brought into their land and God will work sovereignly in the people that he has blinded, 
in the people that he has hardened their hearts, in the people that he has deafened their ears, lest they believe. In that time, God will intervene and bring about their conversion and their salvation at the end of this age. That is what is being described in this text. And in verse 28, he talks about Israel being brought back to their land, back to their promised land. But as we look at these verses, the distinguishing marks of the new birth for Israel at that time are the very same distinguishing marks for anyone's regeneration. And so as we look at this passage, I want us to consider yet again what are these distinguishing marks of the new birth. And as we do, I want to ask you, have you been born again? Have you been born from above? Uh, Could it be that as we heard in the testimonies tonight, could it be that you have the head knowledge but not yet have Christ in your life and in your heart and in your soul? Uh, Could it be that you have the outward facade of religiosity, but you have not yet come to believe upon Christ? And if so, I trust that our study tonight, God will use to bring you to himself. Now, as we look at this passage beginning in, in verse 25, I want to set before you several truths. Number one, God alone executes this work. The new birth is a work that God and God alone initiates and that God brings to pass. There is only one active agent in the new birth, and that is God. This is not a work between God and man. This is solely a work of God in the heart. And I want you to notice, beginning in verse 25, And I want your eye to run down through verse 28. And if you have a pen in your hand, you really may want to draw a circle around every time you see the word I. And I bring to your attention, you'll never see the word we. It is only the word I. Please note, in verse 25, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you. Verse 26. I will give you a new heart. And then what is implied, I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone. And then what is implied, I will give you a heart of flesh. Uh, Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. And then the I is implied when he says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And then in verse 28, I will be your God. Six times in these verses, God says, I will, I will, I will, I will. Not once does he say, you will. God says, I will, and therefore the result will be what will take place in your life. And when you include what should be implied nine times in these four verses, God says, I will. Regeneration is a work of God's grace in the human heart that brings about our conversion. But it is God who is the architect of regeneration. It is God who is the author of regeneration. It is God and God alone who is the agent of regeneration. Sinclair Ferguson says, Regeneration is a divine activity in us in which we are not the actors but the recipients. Close quote. God alone is the actor, and we are the recipients. Let me ask you this question. What part did you play in your physical birth? Uh, probably not much. Uh, probably you just showed up as a, as a result of what God chose to do with your parents and bringing them together, and you are the offspring, so it is in our spiritual new birth. God alone is the executor of this glorious act. And number two, God cleanses from all sin. When God births us into his kingdom, at the same time, simultaneously, he cleanses from all sin. In verse 25, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And this is not a reference to water baptism for no amount of Real physical water could ever wash away sin. Uh, There is only the removal of sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
rather, God is speaking metaphorically here. God is speaking by way of, of, of imagery. And this is figurative language that is based on the water purification practices in the Old Testament when the priest threw water on persons to symbolize their cleansing. Even the water that the priests would sprinkle had no uh, cleansing power in it. It was but a, a, a sign or a symbol of what God was doing by His grace. And so it is in the new birth at that moment when someone is birthed into the kingdom and they immediately call upon the name of the Lord, God sprinkles clean water on them and He says, and you will be clean. What is implied, you will be clean of all of your sin. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, every sin in your life is immediately purged and washed away, and you are immediately made clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 25, he says it again for emphasis, I will cleanse you. We do not clean ourselves up. There is only one who can cleanse us, and that is the one who is the holy God of heaven and earth. He said, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, every blemish, every spot, every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, every act of obedience is immediately, once and for all, now and forever, eternally throughout all of the ages to come, are washed by the grace of God in the blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says at the end of verse 25, and from all your idols. Now, these idols were crafted by those in ancient Israel as they adopted the, the religions of the world, as they came under the influence of, of the Canaanites and Israel in their apostasy in their unbelief, turned away from the living God and turned to, to the dumb idols that they created. Uh, this word for idol is used 38 times in the book of Ezekiel, and this word is a, a derisive term. Literally, it means dung pelts. That is what God thinks of these idols. They are but dung pelts, filthy, stinking idols, unworthy of the worship that was being given to them, but the grace of God yet greater, and God washing away all of this filth and this stench and this corruption out of their hearts as they were whoring after false gods. And so it is in our lives as well. Now, there were idols in our lives. Idols are anything that you love more than God, fear more than God, serve more than God, that have your allegiance and have your loyalty that you pursue. And when the sinner comes to faith in Jesus Christ, we must repent of our idolatry and turn to the living God and believe in Him through His Son. And when we do, we are washed of all the dung pelts in our own soul that have contaminated our own lives. Titus 3 verse 5 says, He saved us by the washing of regeneration. Ephesians 5 verse 26, 26 says, Having cleansed her by the washing of water. When you entered into the kingdom of heaven, God washed you, He scrubbed you down, he, he removed all of the filth from your life and from your soul that you would be clean and spotless before Him. Isaiah 1, verse 18, God says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as wool. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. That is what takes place in the new birth. We are cleansed by the washing of water. And by the way, that is why Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about water baptism is necessary to enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
he is talking about a cleansing from sin. We may not enter into his kingdom unless the Spirit of Almighty God washes us by the blood of the Lamb. But I want you to note third, as we continue to work our way through this text, not only is, does he cleanse us, but third, God gives a new heart. In verse 26, we see that once the soul has been cleansed from its filth, God then places a new heart into the newly purified soul. Look at verse 26. Moreover, meaning in addition to this soul cleansing, I will give you a new heart. God says he will freely give without cost, without merit, to those who are undeserving as a gift of his grace, God will give a new heart. There must be more than just the forgiveness of sin. There must be more than just the cleansing that would take place. There must be a new person on the inside as we would enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, I will give you a new heart. Now, this word for heart uh, stands for the whole nature of a person. In our culture, we, when we say heart, we, we think of the affections. We think of the emotions. But in the Hebrew culture, the heart represented everything that you are on the inside. Your mind, your affections, and your will. And what God is saying, I will give you a new mind that you may know me. I will give you new affections that you will love me. I will give you a new will that you will now begin to walk in obedience to me. God gives a new understanding of the things of God to our minds. He gives a new desire and a hunger and a thirst for the things of God's kingdom. And he gives a new will, a new inclination now by which we choose to be in obedience to his word. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. We are a new creation. And we're not the persons that we once were. We have the same body on the outside, but there is a brand new person on the inside. And that is the result of this new birth. Uh, notice at the end of verse 26, he says... And I will put a new spirit within you. Now, the word spirit here is a lowercase s as it's translated into our English Bible, and rightly so. It's referring to our human spirit. It's really a synonym for heart. Now, this is parallelism where he says he will give us a new heart. And it is as if he is saying, well, let me give you another term that means exactly the same. I will put a new spirit within you. And this new spirit is a, is a new inner disposition to live rightly before God. And when he says he'll put it within you, the idea here is at the very deepest level of our being. It's not something that just lays on the outward facade of our lives. But down at the very depths of our being, God gives us a new spirit. Suddenly now, with our new mind, we can understand the things of God as we're taught by his teacher. And we now have new longings. We now have new appetites. We now have new hungers for the things of God. And we have a new will by which we desire to live in compliance to God's work. And this new spirit is like the rudder of a ship that steers the course uh, of a boat's direction. Even so, this new spirit is redirecting uh, our lives into the path that pleases God. And then he says, I will give you a heart of flesh. At the end of verse 26, God, as it were, opens up our chest cavity and God performs the most delicate surgery, the most delicate heart transplant that, is ever, that ever takes place. 
God opens it up, us up, and by His invisible hands, His all-powerful, all-loving hands, He places down within our soul a brand new heart, a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh is a living heart. And as we will discover in just a moment, the heart that we were born with was a heart of stone. It was dead to God. But this heart that He puts within us, it is a living heart that is alive to God. It is made of flesh. It has a spiritual pulse. It has a a spiritual heartbeat. There is a spiritual throb within our soul that is, that is beating for the things of God. It is pumping spiritual blood throughout our, throughout our, our, our inner spirit. And there is a, a healthy flow of God at work within us. Uh, this heart of flesh means that we are responsive to the things of God. And this heart of flesh means that we are pliable before God. Now, this heart of flesh means that we are alive unto God. It is a living heart, and this is something that only God can give to us down into the depths of our being. Can you feel your spiritual pulse tonight? Can you feel your, this new heart within you that is just beating, that is throbbing, that, that there is an excitement level within your soul, that your heart rate spikes when you hear the gospel? Your, 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 your soul is, uh, is animated when you hear the things of God being presented to you. Uh, there is a, a thrill that goes through you because of this new heart. Oh, religion is, a, is, a, is, is full of drudgery. But to have a new heart and a living relationship with God is the most exciting thing that can ever happen to anyone's life. And so he says... Third, that God gives a new heart. Now, number four, I want you to see yet more of what God does in this act of regeneration. Number four, God removes the old heart. Uh, There is not only the addition of a new heart, but there is the subtraction of the old heart. And that had to be. Notice he says in the middle of verse 26, and I will remove the heart of stone. Every time anyone is ever birthed into the kingdom of God, God, by His grace, removes the heart of stone. Now, this heart of stone is our old nature. It is our old disposition. It is our old sinful inclinations. And it was a heart of stone. Uh, That means it was a hardened heart. Uh, It was stubborn towards the things of God. Uh, It was resistant towards God. Uh, One that has a, a heart of stone is spiritually dead, without any spiritual life. A heart of stone is self willed. A heart of stone is self righteous. A heart of stone is self governing and self controlling. And when God brings a new heart and he takes out that old heart, suddenly, instantly, and immediately, there is now a new desire to be in submission to the things of God, and the old hard-heartedness is suddenly removed. The dominance of evil desires, the dominance of sinful inclinations is, is crushed. And we still struggle with sin. But there is now a new Lord and a new master. We are under new management. And we have now a new desire for the things of God. And the old things have passed away. As we continue to look, I want you to see number five. God implants His Holy Spirit. As we come to verse 27, not only does God give us a new heart, but He implants... His Holy Spirit within our new heart to live on the inside of us now. Notice in verse 27, he says, I will put my spirit within you. This is just layer upon layer upon layer of glorious truth of what God has done in our lives 
at that split second, at that moment when he performed this heart transplant within us. And when he gave us a new heart, he then gave us his Holy Spirit to indwell this new heart, which is in our new soul, this soul that has been cleansed by the washing of water. Now, this reference here to my spirit is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the one who is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and with God the Son. This is the one who has come to take up his royal residence within us. Our bodies now have become the temple of the Holy Spirit in which he lives. We now have the helper within us to help us live the Christian life. We now have the comforter to come alongside of us, to encourage us, to lift us up when we are down. We have the spirit of truth to teach us God's word. We have the spirit of wisdom to guide us. We have the spirit of wisdom and, and understanding to help us see the world as God sees it through the lens of Scripture. This Holy Spirit will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be within us, and it is the Holy Spirit who enables us to live the Christian life. What we cannot do, the Holy Spirit can, and who better to help us live the Christian life and to pursue holiness than the Holy Spirit of God Himself. And when we stray away, the Holy Spirit brings conviction, and He begins to tug on our hearts. He begins to burn with conviction within us so that we'll come back to the pursuit of holiness. And as we continue to walk in, in the path that he lays out for us, he brings his pleasure. He brings his joy. He fills us with his peace as we walk in obedience to his word. What a privilege it, it is to have his spirit living inside of us. So that's number five. God implants his Holy Spirit. Number six. God causes a new walk. I, I want you to see this in verse 27. This new heart and this Holy Spirit will demonstrate itself in an entirely new walk. Notice what he goes on to say. God says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Will God cause us to live the Christian life? Will God cause us to live a life of obedience? According to this text, the answer to this is yes. It is God who is at work within us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. I would remind you that the Holy Spirit is the sovereign Holy Spirit. He has all authority. He has supreme authority. He reigns and rules in our lives. He is leaning on us. He is at work within us causing us, note, to walk in my statutes. Now, the word walk here refers to our daily walk, uh, our Christian walk, our, our spiritual walk. As we put one spiritual foot in front of the other, and as we move out for God in our daily lives, it is God who is causing us to walk in his statutes. This walk is a new walk. It is on a new path. It is headed in a new direction. It is marked by new obedience. And by the way, this implies we were not walking this way. And left to ourselves, we were walking in a totally different direction. It is God who had to cause us to now walk in a, in a totally opposite direction. We once were going according to the course of this world. We were like dead fish floating downstream, going in the wrong direction. And in the new birth, God does a 180 turnaround, and he heads us in a new direction, and we now are walking, notice he says, in my statutes, meaning that we walk within the boundaries of God's word. And then he goes on to say, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Oh, yes, we will. Because God is at work within us, and he will, he will cause us to be careful to observe his commandments. Now, this word careful means that, 
it is now our inclination to give strictest attention to observing the commandments of God. I, I looked up this word, observe, shamar in the Hebrew. And it means to, to, to set a watch over something, like a, a shepherd would watch over his flock, uh, like a watchman would watch over a city. So we are to watch over the Word of God with strictest care so that we will implement it into our lives and observe His ordinances. This is the result of the new birth. It's more than just God cleaning us up. Uh, it's more than just God forgiving us. It's more than God bestowing pardon. It is God implanting a new life within us and putting His Holy Spirit within us and taking out our old heart that was, that was so resistant to God. In essence, God says, I've had enough of that. I love you too much. You're one of my own. I claim you. I birth you. I bring you into my kingdom. And I want you now to live in an entirely new way and to bring honor and glory to me by walking in compliance to my word. Surely we feel this tonight within our own soul. Surely tonight we feel the, the inner witness and the testimony of God the Holy Spirit bearing witness to our spirit of the desire that is within us to pursue the path that is laid out for us in Scripture. This is God's work within us. And then finally, I want you to see number seven. God enters a new relationship. In verse 28, he says, You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. Again, pointing to the, to the end of the age when Israel will be regathered into her land and Israel will be converted and all Israel will be saved and they will be saved the way you and I are saved. There is only one way to enter into the kingdom of heaven and except you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. The Jew has to be born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? There is only one entrance into the kingdom, and it is by the new birth. And it is the same for you and me tonight. Even Gentiles must enter the kingdom through the portals of the new birth. But he says now at the end of verse 27 something that is a universal truth for all who enter into the kingdom. It is true not only of Israel at the end of the age, but it is true of you and me here tonight. God says, you will be my people, and I will be your God. The people who are birthed from above enter into a brand new relationship with God. And this clearly implies that before the new birth, you were not my people, and I was not your God. Uh, you were my people in name only but not in heart reality. And I was not your God. I chose you as a nation, but you have not yet come to know me. But now through the miracle of the new birth, God giving a new heart, God giving a new spirit, in that instant, in that moment, everything changes. And we go from being not the people of God to becoming His possession. And God goes from being uh, one whom we did not know, and suddenly God becomes our God. For God to become our God means that He will extend His graciousness to us, His people, and that God will care for us. God will provide for us. God will go before us and, and lead the way. He will come behind us and protect us from all harm. He will be, be beside us to encourage us along the path of life. He will be around us to, to, to govern everything that is coming into our lives. He will be our God and we will be His people because we have been brought into His kingdom by this sovereign work of grace. This text here tonight that we have considered 
is really the template, is the overlay for your own new birth into the kingdom of heaven. This is what God did in your life. God took the initiative. God looked at you. God said, I will, I will, I will, at a time when you were running away from him, at a time when your heart of stone was hardened towards him. God overcame your resistance, and God opened you up, and God washed you, and he cleansed all of the filth out of your life. And once you were clean on the inside, God said, I'll now put a new heart inside this soul that has been cleansed. And God then took out the old heart. He put his spirit within us. And God now causes us to walk a new path, to go a new way, to live under new management, to live in obedience and in compliance to his word. What a glorious thing it is to be saved. What a, what a wonderful thing it is. We didn't just get out of one line and get into another, and that's all that happened in our lives. No, God came down out of heaven and has come to live inside of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are a new person. You once had B.C. days before Christ, and now you have glorious days with Christ inside of you. And so tonight, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let us give glory to God for our salvation. Let us give glory to God for what he's done in our heart and in our soul. Let us give glory to God for the blood of Christ that has washed us and cleansed us from all of our sin. Let us give glory to God for his Holy Spirit who indwells us. Let us give glory to God who said, I will, I will, I will, with such persistent love that chased us and pursued us until he conquered us and made us trophies of his grace. Let us give all glory to God here tonight for his heart transplant by which he took out that old, filthy, corroded, old heart that had dung pelts in it. Yes, it did. And he has now given to you a brand new heart inside of a cleansed soul where the Holy Spirit of God now lives within. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you tonight for your miracle of the new birth for the new start that you have given us in life, how we praise you that the old things have passed away. What we once were is not the person I am any longer, that you have made us now to be a new creature, that we have all things new on the inside. Lord, thank you for a new mind, a pure mind, a clean mind, a mind that can, can understand your word, Lord, thank you for a new heart that has totally new appetites, totally new affections, totally new uh, loves and desires. And Lord, thank you for a new will that is inclined towards obedience and chooses the things of your kingdom. Lord, we confess that we do not always choose what we ought to choose, but how we praise you that we are not what we once were, that we are new people in Christ and that we are living an entirely new life and it is all of your grace. As we come to the Lord's table tonight, Father, I pray that you would give us such um, a new depth and warmth of affection and love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to, to cherish him all the more. Help us to treasure him. Lord, thank you for introducing us to him and bringing us into union and into communion with him. How we praise you, God, for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.